A beautiful woman is discovered lying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor of her Cape Cod home. She's identified as fashion writer Krista Worthington. But the way she was lying on the floor, it was obvious that something horrible had happened to her. It takes police four years to bring her killer to trial. He seemed like someone who fit the profile of what people wanted the defendant to be. But did they get the right man for the murder of Krista Worthington? Krista Worthington has a glamorous career as a fashion writer. She's lived and worked in London, Paris, and New York, but something is missing from her life. She was a complicated person. It's not easy to describe her quickly. Um, she was very beautiful. She was very smart, very creative. Krista grows tired of the high life. In 1996, she decides to return to her roots in Truro, Cape Cod. Truro has been our home, really kind of the heart of our family. Our grandparents were here for over 80 years. Our great-grandparents were here, and many of us moved back to Truro um, after being away. Already well-established in her career, Krista is ready to settle down. She was kind of at a point in her life, you know, she was of that generation of women who had had a career and then found herself, you know, nearing 40 and wanting to have a child, wanting to have a family. But in Truro, Krista discovers there's just a small pool of eligible men. Eventually, she becomes pregnant by a local married fisherman, Tony Jacket. Ava Worthington is born in the summer of 1999. Krista is 43. Her wish has come true. Three years later, on Sunday, January 6, 2002, the tranquility of Truro, Cape Cod is shattered by the sound of emergency vehicles. I heard the dispatcher say that there was a um, call for a unconscious, unresponsive female. Janet Worthington is not only Krista's cousin, she's also the nearest volunteer emergency worker to the location. It's an address she's familiar with. The call is for her 46-year-old cousin, Krista Worthington. When Janet arrives at the house, she finds Krista's front door is damaged. I ran into the house. I really didn't know what was going on. And um, she was lying on the floor, and she was obviously gone. Krista is lying on her back, naked from the waist down. Blood has oozed from her nose and behind her ear. Her body has stiffened due to rigor mortis. Krista's murder comes as a terrible shock to the small, laid-back Cape Cod community. In the weeks that follow, police interview several suspects. Their first is Tony Jacket, the father of Krista's child. She was pressing him for financial support for Ava, but she is dead before the dispute is settled. Jacket passes a polygraph test, and his DNA does not match any at the crime scene, so he's removed from the list of suspects. The police turn their attention to Tim Arnold, Krista's ex-boyfriend. His DNA matches the semen found on the blanket used to cover Krista's body. He admits having consensual sex with her months before, but denies killing her. He, too, passes a polygraph test, so he's not investigated further. And so, the trail goes cold. Two years after the murder, police still have not found the killer. So in July 2004, they ask anyone who had routine contact with Krista to submit their DNA. Later that year, they also decide to take the drastic step 
of conducting a DNA sweep of all men in Truro. This is in order to solve a, a very heinous, horrible crime that left a little girl without her mother. Hundreds come forward. Forensic teams begin analyzing the DNA samples that also include the samples volunteered months before. One of these is given by Truro garbage man Christopher McCowan. It matches DNA from semen found in Krista's body. Last night at approximately 7.15 p.m., detectives from the Massachusetts State Police detective unit assigned to my office arrested Christopher A. McGowan, age 33, for the 2002 murder of Krista A. Worthington. McGowan is interrogated by police for seven hours. He changes his story several times. Finally, he says he went to Krista's house the night she died with a friend, Jeremy Frazier, and it is he who kills her after McCowan has left. Frazier denies it all and passes a polygraph test. McCowan's allegation is discounted. Instead, his constant story changing, his statement to the police, his DNA match, and the discovery that he has five restraining orders against him on Cape Cod is enough to convince the district attorney he's the killer. Did you kill Krista? In February 2006, McCowan is indicted for the first degree murder, aggravated rape, and armed assault of Krista Worthington. I just knew that the arrest had seemed much too easy and much too pat uh, for me to be comfortable with. Black men from the Deep South are a rarity on Cape Cod. McCowan arrived on the Cape 10 years earlier, having been released from a Florida prison for grand theft auto. All of this, George believes, plays to local prejudices. He's convinced McCown is arrested simply because he's a convenient choice. I held a mirror up to them very early about the issue of race, and I wanted them to know that in this particular case, it was an issue. Charged with the murder of Krista Worthington, Christopher McCowan's trial begins on October 18, 2006. The prosecution is led by local Cape Cod assistant DA, Robert Welsh III. McCowan's defense attorney is Robert George. George realizes that opening statements by the defense are optional, but in this case, he believes he has no choice but to give one. I've always believed that you have to give an opening statement, uh, especially in a, in a case like this, where all of the gruesome evidence is going to be laid out by the prosecutor in his opening. You know, a prosecutor's best friend is a bloody crime, a horrendous crime, an outrageous crime, because it shocks people, uh, you know, into, uh, into voting guilty. George tells the jury to concentrate only on the evidence and reminds them of one matter he believes to be critical. I pounded home the different issues that I wanted the jury to pay attention to, and I let them know, you know, very early on. I held a mirror up to them very early about the issue of race. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wanted them to know that they, you know, in this particular case, it was an issue. George aims to follow a dual strategy. First, he wants to get McCown's statement to the police ruled inadmissible. He argues that he changed his story so many times, it simply cannot be relied upon. He does not deny that his client had sex with Krista. As a second line of defense, he'll try to show that while Krista and McCowan had sex, this doesn't make him either a rapist or a killer. George begins with McCowan's statement. The chief investigator in the case didn't write that statement until six days later. He wrote it from his own notes. He wrote it from memory. This 27-page, uh, uh, you know, report written from memory that purports to be McCowan's statement that was not signed by McCowan, was not read by McCowan, uh, was not tape recorded, was not audio taped, was not videotaped. Despite George's argument, the judge allows the statement to be admitted. George tells the jury that even if they hear the contents of the statement, they should ignore it. I want you to try to imagine if it was you or if it was someone you cared about or someone that you loved, you know, would you want 
uh, someone in your family to be interviewed for five and a half to six hours uh, without food, without drink, without sleep. Would you want that person um, interviewed, uh, interrogated? Now, interviewed is different. This isn't like applying for a job. You know, you're being interrogated. There's all kinds of psychological warfare going on. Having won the argument over the statement, the prosecution calls their first witness, Janet Worthington. I felt that what they wanted me to testify to was what Crystal looked like when I found her. And the, you know, the, the violent, awful nature of it. She seemed to me to be almost posed by the person that had killed her and by that I mean her right leg was it looked as if her leg had been placed in the bottom bookshelf on in the hallway where she was lying and you know so that she was exposed in the most awful way and it was shocking and you know you just thought this whoever did this was making some kind of statement And I think that's what um, I testified to, and that's what, you know, the prosecution wanted to have on record. In cross-examination, Robert George goes on the attack. He basically tried to discredit me entirely, and it was awful. It was an awful experience. George argues that Janet herself changed her story. First, she told police she went no further than the doorway of Krista's house. But when later interviewed on television, she claims to have checked Krista's pulse. George's aim is simply to sow seeds of doubt about the prosecution's version of events. The prosecution's next witness is Dr. Henry Niels. He's the assistant to the medical examiner who conducted the autopsy. He tells the jury that Krista was killed by a single knife wound. She was stabbed with such ferocity that the knife passed through her body and nicked the floorboards beneath. But then George sets out to prove reasonable doubt by picking apart the forensic evidence. I was able to push him back almost 48 hours on time of death. Christopher McCown has admitted being at Krista Worthington's home on Thursday, January 3rd, to take away her Christmas tree. It's his normal day for collecting garbage on her block. This is the day the prosecution says he murdered her. But in cross-examination, Dr. Niels says he cannot be certain on which day she died. The defense argues that death could have occurred actually two days later. Dr. Niels does not deny that this is indeed a possibility. But if the defense is right about the time of death, then the Count could not have killed Krista Worthington because he has an alibi. How I was able to take the time of death away from when they wanted it to be, all the way back to when McCown was sleeping on the couch at his girlfriend's house. George then suggests that while McCown and Krista certainly had sex when he was collecting her Christmas tree, it had also been entirely consensual. This explains why his semen is found in her body. He asked Dr. Niels to describe any trauma to Krista Worthington's body that would be consistent with rape. Niels concedes there was none. George now believes that he struck a killer blow against the prosecution. Their case is that the last person to have seen Krista alive also rapes and murders her. George believes he's shown that not only is there no evidence to prove rape, but that any sex could have taken place two days before the murder. The sex and the killing were not necessarily related. When Dr. Henry Niels testified uh, that there was no vaginal trauma and no evidence of sexual assault, and that he was, you know, he, he was, uh, yeah, I was able to push him back almost 48 hours on time of death. And George goes even further. Intending to prove the crime scene was packed with clues that were ignored or misinterpreted by the police, 
he calls veteran forensic scientist Dr. Richard Safferstein. Safferstein reveals that a hair not belonging to Krista or McCowan found on her body was not analyzed. Could this have been left by the real killer? That blood stains in the house were ignored because it was thought it was all Krista's blood smeared around by her daughter. And that blue and white fibers were found on the body but were never examined. Even more astonishing was the testimony from a DNA expert who said Krista had the DNA of at least three unidentified men under the fingernails of her right hand. None of the genetic profiles match McCowan's or any of the other original police suspects. So if McCowan didn't kill Krista, who did? You just don't think that there's any possible way that a thinking, deliberate, intelligent, fair juror would not have reasonable doubt. At the trial of Christopher McCowan, his defense team puts forward an alternative suspect, McCowan's friend and alleged drug dealer, Jeremy Frazier. The defense argues the police have failed to investigate him properly. Frazier testifies that on the night Krista was killed, he was wearing a blue and white sweater. When you're able to uh, bring out of a witness, you know, bring out of witnesses, that you know, blue and white fibers are found in the vaginal area of a of a victim, and Jeremy Frazier's wearing blue and white a blue and white sweater the night of the incident. So you just don't think that there's any possible way that a thinking, deliberate, intelligent, fair juror would not have reasonable doubt. Frazier denies Robert George's accusations, and he isn't the man on trial. The fact remains, the semen found on Krista's body belongs to McCowan. In his closing argument, George sums up why the jury should have reasonable doubt about the guilt of Christopher McCowan. He reiterates his key statements. That Krista was not raped, that the crime scene was mishandled, and that the time of her death may have been miscalculated, giving McCowan an alibi. Three weeks after the trial opened, the jury retires to deliberate. The jury deliberations dragged on for so many days and turned out to be one of the longest deliberations in the history of Massachusetts. On November 17, 2006, more than a week after deliberations began, the jury gives their verdict. They find McCowan guilty of all charges. I was shocked and disgusted, um, although I, I had a feeling I knew what was coming. At his sentencing hearing, McCowan addresses the court for the first time. It was family, and her. All I can say is that I'm, I'm an innocent man in this case. Despite his plea, the judge hands down the maximum sentence. Hereby sends you to be in prison at the Massachusetts Correctional Institution at Cedar Junction for and during the term of your natural life without the possibility of parole. For the Worthington family of Cape Cod, no sentence will compensate them for the loss of their loved one. No, people say, oh, at least you had some closure. It didn't feel that way to me. Um, it, it just, you know, in some ways it confirms your worst fears about what happened to your loved one. I think for my family and for me, it was um, shattering and it, it continues. I mean, it, it, it shattered our lives and our lives have not been the same and probably won't ever be the same. There are still a few twists in this case. Just over a year after the trial, Robert George is handed evidence from one of the jurors accusing fellow jurors of being racist. George argues his client did not receive a fair trial and that perhaps the jury made up their mind long before it even began. I was disgusted that any juror could just put it all aside 
and vote guilty because they thought he was guilty. Just remember, thinking someone's guilty is not enough. Thinking they're probably guilty, possibly guilty, most likely guilty, you know, I think he's guilty. That is not enough. The original trial judge, Gary Nickerson, takes the allegations seriously and recalls the jury to face questioning. But after a lengthy investigation, in April 2008, he rules that the charges of racism are unfounded and that the trial was fair. But two years later, based on the racism allegations, Christopher McCowan does win an appeal. The court takes an unusually long time, over seven months, to reach a decision. In December 2010, his conviction is upheld. Most on Cape Cod have no doubt that the right man is behind bars. I don't believe that she was having consensual sex with this guy. I, I just don't think she was. And I think the fact that DNA was found on her, um, you know, DNA is DNA. It's pretty conclusive. And um, that's how I look at it. Today, Christopher McCowan remains in prison with no prospect of release.